Wait. METARs offer accurate and highly detailed weather condition reports for aviation, but they are very tricky to read without, well, a decoder ring. Here's a typical METAR. Now, if you watch and listen carefully, you too will be able to impress your friends by rhyming off, oh, the weather in Saskatoon at 2 p.m. is 19 degrees Celsius with wind from the east at 28 kilometers per hour gusting to 46 kilometers per hour. It's lightly raining with some mist, completely overcast though, with two cloud layers at 800 and 4,000 feet, and, and much, much more. All right, let's get into it. METARs stand for Aerodrome Routine Meteorological Reports, and they report the weather conditions at a specific aerodrome at a specific time. They're issued every hour on the hour and may be supplemented by what's called a speci, which is a special meteorological report, if the conditions change substantially within the hour. METARs consist of information coded into groups in a specific sequence. First of all, how do you find a METAR? Well, they're available from the NAV Canada Weather and NOTAM site right here, and we have a link directly to this site in the Drone Pilot Canada app. Once on the site, you enter either an aerodrome code, so CYOW I've entered in this case, or you can enter an actual airport uh, location like Kingston or something like that and select it from a list. Next, you make sure that your METAR button is selected down here, then you hit search and your METARs appear on the right hand side. In this case, we have both a METAR and a speci. A METAR is formatted into what they call groups. 14 groups may appear. Some are optional, so you, they might be missing, and some are repeated in a particular METAR to ensure that all the details of that particular uh, part of the report are spelled out. We're gonna run through every one of these 14 different METAR groups in order. So buckle up. The first METAR group is a very simple one. It is simply the report type. And it's only got two possible values, either literally METAR, which of course is the routine hourly observation, or SPECI, the special meteorological report. SPECIs are issued if there are significant changes since the last report, such as reduced ceilings or visibility, maybe a tornado popped up, or rapidly dropping temperatures. In this example, and we'll be following this same example all the way through, you can see the word METAR, so you know it's a routine report. The second METAR group is called the Location Indicator, and it's also very simple. This is the ICAO location code. Normally it's just the airport code where the observation station is near. And when it's at an airport, and most of the time it is, it's within three kilometers of the center of the aerodrome. In our example, we see CYXE, which is the airport code for Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Okay, that's the end of the easy ones. Now we get into more cryptic stuff. The next group is the date and time of the observation and it's coded rather mystically. The first two digits are simply the day of the month. So in this case, the 29th day of the month. The next four digits are the time of the observation in Zulu time or coordinated universal time as it's formally known. Now for, for METARs, this will always be on the hour, but for species, this will be the time of the change that triggered the event. In our example, it shows 2-9, so the 29th day of the month, followed by 2-0-0-0 Zulu time. Now Saskatchewan is six hours different from Zulu time, so this really means it's on the 29th day of the month at 2 p.m. Okay, here's another simple one. Group 4 is the report modifier and it has only two possible code values. And in some cases, both of them may appear. 
The first value that's possible is auto, and this simply means that the report was generated by an automated weather observation system, which is called an AWOS, by the way. Um, and, and by the way, most of these METARs are in fact generated automatically. The second possible value is CCA. This indicates that the report has been corrected. If it happens to be corrected more than once, subsequent corrections will be shown as CCB, CCC, and so on. In this case, we do in fact have a corrected report because it says CCA. The fifth group type is wind, and it's really important to understand this one. There's five parts to the wind report. Part A is the first three digits, and they are the direction in degrees, and this is true degrees, not magnetic, rounded to the nearest 10, 10 degrees. So the third digit's always going to be zero. So this is the direction the wind is coming from. The next two digits, and they're slammed all together, and sometimes there's three digits just for fun, is the two minute mean, more or less the average, wind speed in knots. Now one knot is 1.8 kilometers per hour, roughly. Now, if there are wind gusts of five knots or more in the preceding 10 minutes, there will also be a G, the letter G, followed by the peak speed that was measured during that period. Again, either two or three digits, depending on how many are required to show the speed. And then finally, it will so show KT for knots. And the reason they show the KT, besides the fact that that gives you a bit of a clue that this is the wind group, is that in some countries, they'll have different units. So they might have KPH or meters per second, in fact, in some places in Europe. But in North America, it's KT. Now, if there is a wind direction variation, in other words, the wind is kind of swinging around from side to side, and, and this only shows up if there's significant amount of wind, um, if there's a wind direction variation, and it varies by 60 degrees or more in the 10 minute uh, observation period, the extreme directions are shown as the first three digit direction, then the letter V, then the other three digit direction. Got that? This is way easier to understand by walking through an example. So in our case, we see 09015G25KT. Great. So let's break it down. The first three digits is the wind direction. 090 is rounded to the nearest tenth, so it's 90 degrees, um, so which means it's coming from the east. The next two digits are 15. That means 15 knots. The fact that there's a G means that there's gusts. So the next information is about how what the peak speed is in terms of those gusts. We see 25. So it's normally 15 knots, but it's gusting to 25 knots. And the KT, of course, indicates that it's knots. Let's look at a couple more examples. If you see five zeros in a row followed by KT, this means it's calm. And in this example, we see 300, so the wind is from direction 300 degrees, 15 gusting to 25 knots again. And now we see this wind variation group showing up after it. It's not really a separate group. It's still part of the wind group, but whatever. So, and in this case, we recognize it because it's got the V in the middle and it shows 260, which means that the direction at, at one end of the extreme is 260 degrees and it varies all the way out to 340 degrees. Okay, so the wind is kind of swinging back and forth in those directions, but at the exact moment of the observation, it was at 300 degrees. Okay, so it's not that hard to, to figure out once you understand the decoding ring. After the wind group is group number six, the prevailing visibility. Now this is reported in statute miles, and a statute mile is 1.61 kilometers. And in some cases it's represented as fractions. Kind of odd, by the way, that it's in statute miles and not nautical miles, like most other things in aviation. But there you go. That's what it is. So in our example, it's 3 slash 4 SM. 
So that's interpreted as, as three quarters, so 0 0.75 statute miles. So I converted it to 1.2 kilometers. And the SM, of course, stands for statute miles. The next group is runway visual range, sometimes abbreviated RVR. This is an optional group, so it only appears if the prevailing visibility, that preceding group that we just talked about, is less than one statute mile, or if the RVR is less than 6,000 feet. If it appears, this group is repeated for each runway to a maximum of four runways. The first letter will be R for runway, followed by the two-digit runway number, and that may also have an L, C, or R following it for left, center, or right in the case of parallel runways. And then next is the visual range to the takeoff or landing point, followed by FT for feet. Now, if this visual range is varying over time during the observation period, it will be followed by slash U for an upward trend. In other words, the visibility is getting better or slash D for a downward trend or slash N for no distinct trend at all. And the slash N may or may not appear. And here is our example. Runway 09 has 4,000 feet of visual range and that visual range or visibility is decreasing because there's a slash D. Our next group is variations in runway visual range. This group is optional, so it might not appear and will only appear if the RVR values that we looked at in the preceding section vary by at least 20% and by at least 150 feet within the 10 minute measuring period. Now, in this case, up to two runways are reported, so you could have two instances of this particular group. The minimum and maximum RVRs are shown separated by a V. Our standard example didn't actually have this group in it, so here's a separate example. You can see R06L means runway 06, left-hand one, varies in terms of its runway visual, visual range between 1,000 feet and 2,400 feet, and it's going up. The trend is upwards, so it's improving. The next group is really important. It's the present weather. Now, this is reported using international codes with as many as are required to capture the current weather scene. And there's a whole table, I'll show you that on the next screen, that, uh, that captures all of these weird codes. Now, each of these groups or subgroups can have from two to nine characters, each consisting of optionally, a qualifier, which will show the intensity of the weather phenomena or the vicinity or some other descriptor, and we'll see these again, and then the actual weather phenomena. Now this can be rain or even smoke, like from a, say a forest fire or a tornado or anything like that. And there's a very large number of these strange coats. If multiple phenomena are reported, say there's rain and a tornado, then the predominant one is reported first. In this case, probably the tornado. Here's our example. It shows a minus sign or a hyphen, which means light. That's the qualifier, followed by RA, which means rain, and then BR, which means mist. I, I remember that one. It's sort of like bit of rain, BR. So here's the present weather code table, and this is directly from the Aviation Information Manual or the AIM document, MET section, uh, table 8.1. So on the left here, you can see the qualifiers, and they kind of break into a couple of little categories. There's minus and plus for light and heavy, so those apply typically to precipitation. Um, there's VC, which means it's in the vicinity. So it's not actually seen at the weather observation point, but somehow they've managed to detect it close by. And then there's a number of descriptor qualifiers. Uh, shallow patches, partial and drifting, refers mostly to snow and, and perhaps to sand. 
Uh, showers or shower or showers refers mostly to snow and rain. Like So not all of these descriptors or qualifiers apply to all of the weather phenomena. Thunderstorm, fairly obvious. Freezing would apply to, say, rain, like freezing rain. Um, and then we get into the weather phenomena, and there's three main categories. There's precipitation, so there's drizzle, rain, snow, snow grains, ice crystals, ice pellets, hail, snow pellets, obviously some <laughs> strange variations here, um, and then unknown precipitation, and this is when an automatic system cannot discern whether it's, say, the difference between hail and snow pellets, things like that. Um, the second category of weather phenomena is other kinds of uh, visibility issues. So they call them obscurations. So mist, as I said, BR, bit of rain, um, fog, uh, smoke, interesting abbreviation there, FU. Uh, I guess for fume, perhaps to, to avoid uh, confusion with one of the snow type abbreviations. Uh, dust, sand, haze, and volcanic ash. That's a scary one. Uh, and then there's other things. So you could have dust and sand, swirls, uh, or whirls, excuse me, dust devils specifically, squalls, tornadoes, or water spouts are a special category unto themselves. Sandstorms, don't get too many of those in Canada, but I imagine it's, it's possible in some spots, or dust storms. So these are the codes that you can see in the present weather group of the, of the METAR. And again, you could have many of these all at the same time, and they would be ordered in the METAR according to their, their dominance. So thunderstorms, uh, storms and things like that. Uh, would be coming up first and then the, the lesser events after that. Let's have a look at some more examples and I've left the little table at the bottom there for reference. So the first one, plus sign DR SN. That means heavy, plus sign is heavy, DR is drifting snow. Second one, VC TSRA. The TS and the RA is a thunderstorm with rain. The VC qualifier at the beginning means it's in the vicinity. So that means that it's not at the actual observation site, but somehow they were able to observe it, um, but it wasn't occurring exactly at the observation site. This third one is a little strange because they've jammed all the letters together, and um, this happens sometimes. So minus sign then, so that means light, SH, showers, with rain, RA, and hail, GR. Okay, there's some examples for you. Group 10 is called sky conditions, and it's mostly around the clouds. So this group appears potentially multiple times for each layer of cloud in the sky, starting at the surface and moving upwards. Each time the group appears, it will have two or three subsections. The first part will be a sky condition code. It's a three letter code and you'll see the table on the next page. And then the ceiling or how high that particular condition is. And this one is measured in hundreds of feet. Okay, hundreds of feet, I wanna emphasize that. And then the cloud type. But the cloud type will only be shown if it's cumulonimbus like this, which is like a thunderhead effectively, or a towering cumulus, which is growing to be a cumulonimbus essentially. Only those two types of clouds are shown in this group. Now, stay tuned because in the remarks section, you do see other kinds of clouds. Okay, let's look at our example. In our example, we have two groups for this sky condition. The first one starts with BKN, and sorry, I haven't shown you the table yet, but BKN stands for broken cloud cover, and it says 008. It's in hundreds of feet, so that's at 800 feet up, the, the bottom of it, basically the ceiling of that broken layer. And then above that, we have an OVC, which is overcast, which means completely covering the sky with clouds at 40, which means 4,000 feet. Okay, so there's our example. 
Now let's have a look at that sky condition table. The way they've coded these is in eighths of the sky. They're called octas. So if the sky is completely clear, it's SKC for sky clear, no clouds present. If the clouds are covering between one eighth and two eighths totally across the sky, it's considered few, FEW. If it's between three eighths and half or four eighths of the sky, it's considered scattered. Between five eighths and completely covered, it's broken. And then finally, if it's completely covered, it's considered overcast, which is OVC. Now there's another code called CLEAR or CLR, which means it's clear below 25,000 feet as interpreted by the automatic weather system. The next group is an easy one, temperature and dew point. The air temperature is listed first in degrees Celsius. It is rounded to the nearest degree. And the only trick here is that if it's a negative temperature, instead of putting a minus sign, it is preceded by the letter M. So M01 means negative one degree Celsius. The dew point is then shown after a slash. And again, it's in degrees Celsius. And if it's negative, it has an M instead of a minus sign. Very simple. In our example, we can see that the air temperature is 21 degrees C and the dew point is 19. The next group is called the altimeter setting. So this is the air pressure at this location. The altimeter setting group consists of an A, that's your trigger to know that it's the altimeter section, followed by the value in inches of mercury. And the trick here is that there's four digits and there's a decimal assumed between the second and third digits. So in our example, A2992 means the altimeter setting is 29.92 inches of mercury. Group 13, wind shear. Yes, we're almost done. This group appears only if low level wind shear is present at one or more runways within 1500 feet above ground level. You'll know there's a wind shear group because it starts with WS, cleverly for wind shear, followed by the runway number, so RWY, and then the actual number. And of course, the runway number could also be followed by an LC or R if you have parallel runways for left, center, or right. Incidentally, if all the runways have wind shear, it will say WS, all runways. Okay, so here's our example, WS, runway 09. So there's wind shear on runway 09. Finally, there is a remarks group, group number 14. And it can be very long because there can be all sorts of little remarks, comments, and additional detail in this particular section. The group begins with RMK followed by multiple subgroups. So the typical ones are as follows. Cloud layers. So this is where all the different kinds of clouds are represented, even if they're not storm clouds. So they are reported by type and the eighths of the site, the octas of the sky that are obscured. The types of clouds are reported using standard abbreviations from yet another table in the AIM document. And the abbreviations are pretty understandable if you're into clouds. So CU is cumulus, uh, thunderhead cloud, a cumulonimbus cloud is a CB, for example. So these are the codes that you'll see in this section of the METAR. So in our example, which I show at the bottom here, SF5 means 5 eighths of the sky is obscured by stratus fractus clouds. These are kind of ragged uh, stratus clouds, low um, continuous clouds. And NS3 means 3 eighths of the sky is obscured by nimbostratus clouds. These are very flat, um, low-lying uh, rain clouds. The next subsection is general weather conditions. So in, in our example, we have vis NW38, which means visibility to the northwest is 3 eighths statute miles. 
followed by the strangest group of all, mean sea level pressure. And this is an abbreviated pressure, so don't just read the number. And it's measured in hectopascals. Now, our example has SLP for sea level pressure, 134. You have to look at the first digit. If it's 0, 1, 2, or 3, you add 1, 0 to the beginning. If it's 7, 8, or 9, you add a 9 to the beginning. So with 134, that means you add 10, so it's 1013 point, forgot to mention you stick a decimal in there, 0.4 hectopascals. Fun, eh? And finally, density altitude. If it is 200 feet or more than the actual aerodrome elevation, this subgroup is mentioned, density altitude. In our example, it happens to be 2500 feet, meaning the density altitude is, amazingly, 2500 feet. So again, the remark group can be quite voluminous, and you can see that in our example. So the first subgroup is the clouds, SF5, means 5 eighths of the cloud is obscured by SF. We're using that cloud abbreviation table that I showed earlier, stratus fractus clouds. And then NS3 means 3 eighths of the, cloud, of the sky is obscured by nimbostratus clouds, the rain clouds. Visibility, then sea level pressure in that very strange coding. Finally, density altitude. And here you go. Here's your decoder ring with most of the key facts all consolidated onto one sheet. If you found this video helpful, give me a thumbs up and leave me a comment down below. If you don't already do so, please subscribe to my channel and hit that bell for notifications of every one of my upcoming videos. Thanks again for watching.